Welcome to the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. My name is Leon. It's time to do another design video for the UWS-1 Ultralight Airplane design. This time let's select an airfoil for the wing. We have worked out the wing area and the wing plan form for the UWS-1 Ultralight design. Next thing we need to do on the design is figure out what airfoil we should use for the wing. I am going to cut this video up into two parts. It's going to get pretty long if I don't. So on the first part, we're only going to talk about the characteristics that we're going to look at in selecting our airfoil. The second part, though, we will assign values to those characteristics, and then we will use those values of those characteristics in order to select our airfoil. There is virtually an unlimited number of airfoils that we can choose from for an airplane. And if you'd like to see some of them, you can go to this website, airfoiltools.com, and you will find a whole bunch of them. Well, since there are so many, we need to come up with some kind of criteria to knock down the number of airfoils we have to choose from, so it's a little easier to make a choice. There are a wide variety of criteria that we can use for selecting our airfoil, and I've just put a few of them here. One of them is a laminar versus turbulent shape of the airfoil, whether the boundary layer going over that airfoil is laminar, which you would have low drag, or whether it's turbulent, which actually helps keep the boundary layer attached to the airfoil to higher angles of attack, but it has a little more drag too. We can also look at what the coefficient of lift is at stall and what that angle of attack is at stall. We generally want for these ultralights a much higher coefficient lift at the stall. Angle of attack isn't quite as important, but if that angle of attack at stall is really large, we could end up hitting our tail when we're trying to land. So it, 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 it can be a factor. Uh, to try to get a low drag at cruise, we might want to look at the coefficient of lift versus the coefficient of drag. That's usually lift to drag ratio, you want that higher. For this design, I probably won't give too much consideration to this, although I won't pick one that has a large drag. The coefficient of moment at cruise and stall can be fairly critical for our ultralight. We want that to be low so that we don't have to have a large tail to counteract the pitching moment of the airfoil. We'll talk about that shortly. And spar thickness, we want to have a airfoil that can be fairly thick without having a large drag penalty or be prone to stalling early. And we're going to cover these in a little bit of detail here as we go. So let's talk a little bit about our decision of a laminar airfoil versus a turbulent airfoil. When we're talking about laminar, we're usually talking about a boundary layer that flows very smoothly over about the at least the first 40% of the cord. If you've looked at some of these interesting fountains that are shooting streams of water where that stream is perfectly smooth, it stays the same size, arcs up in the air, comes back down without breaking up, that's laminar flow. And so we're talking about that kind of flow right along the curvature of the airfoil. Now this laminar airfoils have very low drag. One of the problems that many of these airfoils have though is that they frequently have a very abrupt stall, which means they go from having a high coefficient lift and the next little angle increase in angle of attack drops that coefficient of lift uh, dramatically. Now, they don't all do that, but a lot of the earlier ones certainly do. So that's one of the possible drawbacks of a laminar airfoil. Another drawback to laminar airfoils is if the laminar flow is tripped, to turbulent before it gets back to about that 40% on the cord, you can actually have a greater drag with the laminar airfoil than you with the turbulent. That's because the turbulence increases dramatically once you've tripped it from laminar to turbulent, whereas a airfoil that's designed to be turbulent will have low turbulence all along that boundary layer. And so if you get bugs on the leading edge of your airfoil, that can actually disrupt that laminar flow immediately right at the leading edge and so you've got large turbulence all the way back from leading edge to trailing edge. That can increase your drag to a worse value than just a plain turbulent 
airfoil that has some bugs on the front of it. Now that we've talked about lander, you can kind of have an idea what turbulent is. A turbulent airfoil has some mild eddies that are occurring within that boundary layer. It helps keep that boundary layer somewhat energized and helps to prevent it from actually separating from the airfoil as you increase the angle of attack. So on a turbulent airfoil, you can often get a much higher angle of attack than you would with a laminar airfoil, and thus you can get frequently a higher coefficient of lift. But like I said, with a slightly turbulent airfoil, you get just a little bit more drag than you would with a laminar airfoil that's working as it's designed to work. Now let's talk a little bit about another design decision, which would be the coefficient of lift at stall, and what is that angle of attack at stall for an airfoil? Well, if you remember when we were working on our surface area for our UWS-1 wing, we were using a coefficient of lift to try to calculate our surface area. The higher coefficient of lift we can get for our stall condition of our airfoil, the smaller our surface area of our wing will have to be, and that means the lighter our airplane will be trying to meet that 254 pound limit. So we want an airfoil that will have a fairly high coefficient of lift at stall. But we don't want to weight that coefficient of lift too much, give it too much consideration, at least so much that we compromise on some of the other desirable characteristics on our airfoil. Let's talk a little bit about that. Frequently, the way you're going to increase your coefficient of lift is to add camber to your airfoil. Or another thing is to droop or drop that trailing edge or even leading edge of your airfoil, which effectively gives you a greater camber. One of the problems you get after you get past a certain point of camber, you dramatically start increasing the drag of your airfoil. Even at cruise, you'll start getting drag. Once you get that camber really increasing, one of the problems you're going to encounter is that the boundary layer on the bottom side of your wing where you're going to have a camber it's going to become cupped once you really increase that camber beyond a certain point you're going to start getting separation of that boundary layer underneath and get significant turbulence and that will really increase the coefficient of drag now here's another thing to think about let's say you've got significant camber on your wing and you want to add flaps well, one of the things you'll notice if you play around with some of these design programs, if you have a lot of camber and then you go and add flaps, and let's just talk about plain flaps for now, you don't end up increasing coefficient of lift that much. You increase it some, but not a whole lot. For an airfoil that isn't as much cambered, has some camber, a flap will have much more effect on increasing your coefficient of lift. So one of the things that's probably a pretty good compromise is get put some camber on the airfoil to get a nice coefficient of lift when you're in your cruise speed and then add significant flaps to increase your coefficient of lift at stall. So if you compromise right between your uh, coefficient of lift for cruise and your coefficient of lift with your flaps for stall, you can get a nice combination of low drag at cruise and very high lift at stall. So that's something we'll have to work on. Here we're trying to have a kind of a compromise between the coefficient lift and coefficient drag. And we really only care about that at cruise. What we'd like to do is to have a nice coefficient lift, low coefficient of drag at cruise so that we can be efficient with our wing. One of the nice things is to have a small coefficient drag at cruise. Now, if you remember back earlier, we were talking about laminar flow. Well, one of the ways to get a small coefficient of drag at cruise is to have a laminar airfoil. I'm not going to give this quite as much consideration for our airfoil selection. I will try to avoid the worst case where we have huge drag, low lift airfoils. But I'm probably not going to go to the other extent trying to have huge coefficient lift and tiny tiny coefficient of drag it's really not worth the effort to go into a, a lot of work trying to have that lift to drag coefficient being high we want it to be good but it's not worth the effort to try to really bring out every last bit of can out of that coefficient now we come to the coefficient of moment and this is a little more important for our ultralight airplanes we really want to have a 
aerofoil that has a low coefficient of moment. Hopefully I've done a uh, aerial terminology video for coefficient of moment by the time you see this video. And if I have, I'll put a, a card up there in the upper right hand corner of this video for you to click to. But just about any cambered wing is going to have a coefficient of moment that tries to pitch that airfoil down at the nose as you're flying. Now, how much that occurs changes depending on your angle of attack. Now, we have to counter that, otherwise you'd pitch down and fly into the ground. How do we counter that? Well, we got to have either a canard that lifts at the front to counter that, or we have to have a tail behind the wing that pushes down to counter that. But we don't want to have to have a whole lot of extra lift at the front for canard or a whole lot of pushing down at the back, uh, particularly with our a tail at the back, because any pushing down that that tail does has to be lifted by the wing to counter that extra weight. You're, anytime you're pushing down somewhere on, on the airplane, you got to counter that with lift. So we want to lower that pitching moment if we can. Now generally, the easiest way to do that is with less camber. Now some airfoils are just better at it than others, even with roughly the same camber. So we can give that some consideration, but a good way to uh, deal with it is just not have as much camber. For example, a symmetrical airfoil has the same curvature on top and bottom, has a coefficient of moment of zero, at least at zero angle of attack. That changes a little bit as the angle of attack increases, but it's still usually uh, much less than with a cambered airfoil. Another reason to have a coefficient of moment that's low our tail has to be bigger in order to have that downforce, the greater your coefficient of moment is. So the greater the coefficient of moment, the larger the tail or the farther back. I mean, you can, that's another way to deal with it, to move it back. But whether you have a bigger horizontal tail or you move the tail farther back, either way, you're going to have to add weight to the airplane. And that's something we do not want an ultralight. So that's another reason to have a small coefficient of moment for an airfoil. Our last consideration is the spar thickness. We want to have a fairly thick spar on our wing for ultralight. The thicker we can make that spar, the less material we have to put into the spar caps to make it strong. A short spar from top to bottom has to have more material in its spar caps to make it strong. So if our wing is thicker, we should theoretically be able to make our wing lighter because the spar does not have to be as heavy to make it strong. Not all airfoils are going to respond the same to a thicker wing. So we'll have to give a little bit of consideration to airfoils that are good with thicker wings. For part two of this video, we will assign some values or range of values to our various selection criteria for airfoil. And then we will select an airfoil for the UWS-1 Ultralight.